Roll up your sleeves, because we have a lot of work ahead of us. Hi, my name is Kays and welcome to another Red Brain tutorial. So first things first, I'm gonna roll my sleeves back up because believe it or not, even though it's the middle of May here in Los Angeles, it's actually kind of chilly today. So, you know, I'm like a little bit cold. First, a little bit of catching up. I haven't posted as many tutorials as I wanted and the reason why is because I've been very, very busy on a brand new project. It's a sci-fi uh, series that I'm developing with another very talented artist in the UK and it's coming along great, but it's been taking up a a lot of my time so sorry about that on the plus side you're gonna hear a lot more about it in the coming months and of course there's gonna be a lot of tutorials based on all the things that I'm doing the other thing I wanted to mention is that I'm moving into using blender a lot more so you're gonna start seeing a lot more blender centric tutorials on this channel however I do want to say that blender and Houdini make a really formidable pair so if you're a blender user I would highly encourage you to check out Houdini and if you're a Houdini user, I would highly encourage you to do the opposite and check out Blender. I think the two programs work together wonderfully because basically the strengths of one are the weaknesses of the other and vice versa. And I think the two programs just complement each other really, really well. What we're going to be doing today is going to be mostly inside of Houdini. I also want to say that what we're going to be doing today is uh, should be doable even with the apprentice version of Houdini. So you don't necessarily need to go and buy the full indie version or studio version of uh, Houdini. I think the apprentice version is going to do just fine. Apologies, they are doing a lot of work next door. Uh, there's jackhammering going on. There's uh, like, I don't know, mowing the lawns and like cutting down trees. It's all sorts of crazy here today. So it's gonna be a little bit noisy in the background. Sorry about that, but unfortunately today's the only day that I have to do this tutorial and I thought, well, I just gotta do it. On that note, let's get into the fun stuff. All right, so if you saw some of my like best free resources online video on this channel, then you know that one of my favorite places to go and look at assets is ArtStation. There's some really amazing work by some really amazing and talented artists. Uh, this is some stuff by Mark Zhang and uh, he's got like cockpits and uh, you might have seen this guy on uh, one of my previous tutorials and then who else do we have? Uh, Alexander Ivanov, uh, he does like a lot of kind of Star Wars inspired stuff but look at his models they're just gorgeous and all sorts of like crazy kit bash pieces and so on and so forth and then there's this other artist uh that goes by the name of gezi bekeye i believe i'm mispronouncing his name correctly um but gezi is also another very talented artist and i've been purchasing some of his models to use as a starting point for what i need to do in my own productions however there is a problem some of these models are not what I would call exactly production ready, okay? And part of the reason is that uh, a lot of times they don't have any UVs. I mean, if you kind of click on, uh, on some of this stuff, uh, Gezi even tells you, it's like uh, the model contains no UVs, okay? He's utilizing um, some procedural materials and triplanar uh, nodes to basically texture this entire scene. And, uh, you know, and that's a big problem, especially if you want to retexture some of this stuff, if you want to customize the models. Uh, the other problem is the fact that a lot of them tend to be really, really heavy when it comes to geometry. Uh, for instance, like this uh, Euron spacecraft uh, model, I mean, it's uh, 13 million polygons. I mean, that's... That's really huge, right? So, especially if you want to use it in a scene that also contains other geometry elements, this is going to be a bit of a problem because it's just going to be like too many polygons and all of a sudden like your file sizes are going to be huge and Blender or Houdini are going to start acting sluggish and I don't know, it's going to be like a little bit of a mess. And last but not least, uh, because a lot of times the way these artists uh, create these models is uh, by using like sculpting software, uh, you know, like uh, ZBrush for instance. Uh, the geometry, the topology is not exactly what I would call like clean topology. Uh, for this particular tutorial, we are going to be using this model, which is the Cosmonaut Orel 
model, okay? So if you want to pick it up, if you want to follow along with the tutorial step by step, you know, you can grab this right here at ArtStation, just uh, uh, do a search for uh, Gezi Bekeye or uh, the Cosmonaut, or I'll, at any rate, I will post a link to this model in the description below. But look at this model, I mean, it's just kind of like a beautiful, beautiful kind of cosmonaut um, outfit. Uh, I mean, it's got like a really great helmet, it's got a camera, like a backpack. Uh, I mean, it's really, really gorgeous. Okay, so I opened the Blender file that Gezi gives us, and uh, here it is. Uh, we're done, guys. Uh, look at that. No, actually, we are not even getting started quite yet. So, I mean, this looks great, as I said, but uh, if you take a look at the scene collection, I mean, you'll start seeing where the problem lies. I mean, we have so many different pieces, parts to this entire mesh. I mean, aside from the fact that it's coming in actually at over 6 million triangles and over 4 million faces, there's just like so much of this little pieces parts and they're not really fully labeled. I mean, some of them are like, you know, body, but you know, a lot of them are like cube, cube block, spiral. I mean, what does this stuff even mean, right? And then in addition to that, we have all of these modifiers that are part of the file. So if we want to actually kind of work with this and kind of rig this cosmonaut and, and do something with this overall model, we would have to apply the modifiers. And anyway, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons why this is not an ideal way of working with this model as is, okay? All right, so here we are in Houdini, and I can already hear some of you guys say, why couldn't we just do everything in Blender? Blender is super awesome. And you're right, Blender is super awesome. However, there are some things that I still find to be easier to be done in Houdini, and I think it's gonna make relatively quick work with a lot of the complex stuff that we're gonna need to do to our geometry. So here we are in Houdini, and first thing I wanna do is hit the equal sign on the keyboard and navigate to the Cosmonaut ORL FPX file that comes as part of this package from ArtStation from Gezi. You know, right off the bat, I can see there's some kind of weird stuff going on. Also, the size of the Cosmonaut right now is gigantic. This thing is over 100 meters tall, and that's because of the way that Houdini converts the units of measurements. So let's start with resizing our Cosmonaut. I'm just gonna double click on this guy, and here we are in the sub context, and uh, what I'm gonna use to resize our Cosmonaut is gonna be this uh, match size node, and I do believe this is part of the side effects labs. So as I said, get side effects labs. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say scale to fit and uniform scale. And let's say that this guy is you know, relatively kind of tallish dude, but you know, he's also wearing boots, he's got a helmet. So let's say that it's like two meters from toes to head. So I'm just gonna type in two, two, and two, and then I'm gonna hit spacebar G in the viewport so that we can zoom in. This is like the equivalent of hitting the period key on your number keypad uh, in Blender. So here is our cosmonaut, and he's definitely resized. He's definitely a lot smaller, but now it's too small. And we can see this container, this uh, two by two by two cube, and he's definitely a lot smaller than that. And the reason why is because, as I said, we have a lot of spare points that are just kind of floating in midair and those are confusing this match size node. So we need to get rid of a lot of these kind of points. And as a matter of fact, if I middle click on any of those nodes, you'll see that we have 123 unconnected points. So the first thing I wanna do is actually go back to my mesh here and before this match size, I wanna put a clean node, okay? We're gonna use the clean node to help us get rid of these points that are just kind of floating nowhere and they're not doing anybody any good. So in a clean node, uh, I'm just gonna say remove unused points. I'm just gonna also uncheck for right now, remove degenerate primitives and remove NANs. We're gonna deal with those a little bit later. But for right now, I just wanna remove the unused points. We go back to the match size and we can see that, okay, now our cosmonaut is exactly two meters from toes to the tip of the helmet. Great. Uh, the other thing I wanna do is probably um, line him up so that his feet are on the floor. Right now he's perfectly centered. 
So uh, I want to change this justify y to minimum instead of center. And that's going to put him with his feet on the floor. So, uh, the next thing I want to do is just kind of inspect our mesh a little bit. See a little bit what is being brought into Houdini here. And right off the top, I can see that we have some problem with some normals. The reason why this is this uh, blue, purplish blue here is because the normals on this particular piece are inverted. So we're gonna have to reverse those. I'm just gonna make a mental note right now that uh, whenever we come across this part to reverse those normals so that we don't have this problem. Uh, we can also see that this mesh is really, really thick. And uh, what else? I'm gonna keep an eye out elsewhere for some other mesh issues or normal issues. I can see back here, there's, uh, there's a little something something hiding here, but it's kind of hidden, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. I, I, I would say when the normals, with the normals, uh, it's just like this guy right here that I'm going to have to like fix. Okay, cool. It's just too huge. It's like 14 million vertices, over 4 million polygons. It's got all of these attributes that we probably don't really need. And, um, and especially, you know, even though like 4 million polys is not the end of the world, but if we want to use this in the context of a larger scene that might be another 10 or 15 million polys itself, then this is not going to help us. Especially back in Blender, I've noticed that you start going over like 20 million polygons and everything kind of tends to become a little bit more sluggish. You know, the edit mode is more sluggish, like the file sizes grow really large and anyway, Smaller is better even if you're doing cinematic productions. If you don't really need that much mesh, it's always better to work with a little bit less polygons if you can help it. And the other thing that we want to address, aside from, you know, little normal issues or whatever else we might come across, is if I hit spacebar 5 to take a look at the UVs, You'll see that even though Gezi says this model doesn't have any UVs, it actually does. Those are probably auto-generated from Blender when he was modeling, but there's a lot of really strange things going on. I mean, for one, uh, this is just like a bunch of overlapping uh, UV meshes. I mean, it looks kind of artistic and cool, like almost like some, some piece of abstract uh, modern art, but it's not going to help us when it comes to UVs, especially as we want to go into Substance Painter. All right, so next, let's take a look at all of these attributes that we have. I'm going to hit the middle mouse button on my mouse and take a quick look here at what we have. We have this uh, FBX attributes, which we don't really need. We have 246 unique name attributes. Those are probably matching all of the little pieces parts that we saw in Blender. And those are not going to be particularly useful to us. There's a variation map. I don't even know exactly what that does. We have all sorts of, you know, UVs that, as I said, we can't really use. We have some normal. Uh, most importantly, we do have this shop underscore material path um, string attributes. This matches the actual materials, and I think this is going to come in very handy as we try to organize this mesh and kind of break it up into some smaller chunks that we can then UV unwrap and, and kind of manage a little bit easier. So this is like 27 different unique materials. So this is probably like the only attributes that I'm really interested in keeping and everything else we can get rid of. So uh, what I like to do is use the delete attribute delete node to kind of clean things up a little bit. And I'm going to go into the point attributes. So I'm just going to hit uh, the asterisk right here. Asterisk in Houdini basically means everything. Just get rid of everything. So I'm just going to get rid of all the point attributes. Don't worry, it's always going to keep the position. It's not going to get rid of that or else we wouldn't have a mesh. Uh, so just asterisk, that's going to take care of all the FBX attributes that we don't need. Uh, same thing with the vertex attributes. I mean, we could keep the normal, but I'm just going to like rebuild them anyway. So asterisk on the vertex attributes. Uh, primitive attributes, we do want to keep our shop at material path. So I'm just going to get rid of the name attribute and I'm going to get rid of this variation map. And last but not least, we don't really have any detail attributes, but you know what? I'm just going to put an asterisk there anyway. So, okay. So, having done that, if we now middle click, we'll see a much, much cleaner attribute list. So, we have our points and then we have our 27 unique materials.
So what I want to be able to do is I want to use my materials to create some groups, okay? And then I'm going to use those groups in conjunction with the blast node to basically isolate all of our different pieces, parts of the cosmonaut so that then we can tackle it in a more kind of, you know, efficient way. So uh, these attributes, however, uh, are right now just like string attributes. They're not groups. So we need to figure out a way to convert those into some groups. And the way we're going to do this is with this handy dandy partition node. Okay. So what the partition node is going to allow us to do is to take these material attributes and say, use them to create a set of groups for us. So uh, what I want to do is I'm going to write a little something, something that might appear to be a little bit weird to you guys. I'm going to actually post it in the description so you can kind of copy and paste it and maybe keep it for future reference. So we're going to start out with adding a backtick. And the backtick, just so you know, it's not the apostrophe on the keyboard, but it's actually this guy right here. It's, uh, it's right below like the escape key, okay? That's the back tick. So don't get confused. It's not an apostrophe, it's a back tick. Uh, the next thing we want to do is type an ampersand at, and then what we want to do is we want to use this shop underscore material path as the definition for this. So I'm going to type shop underscore material path and then I'm going to close this with another backtick. Okay. So what this is going to do is it's going to look at the material path attributes and it's going to say, okay, create groups out of these. So now that I have this little rule in place, I can middle click and you will see that now not only do we have this 27 unique attributes, we also have 27 primitive groups. So this is going to come in really, really handy to help us organize this mesh into something that, you know, it's a little bit more usable. Okay, so now that we have our groups in place, we can get onto the business of organizing our mesh and kind of making it work for what we need to do. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to instance a blast node and blast is a really awesome node that Houdini gives us to basically obliterate whatever geometry we need to do. And I'm going to use it to basically split all of our material groups into their own little subsections. Okay. And the way I'm going to do this right now is just kind of blasted everything. I'm actually going to do the opposite. I'm going to say delete non-selected. Okay. And then I'm going to select the first group, which in this case is anodized blue. Okay. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to click on the delete unused groups and I'm going to say recompute the normals anyway, because we got rid of the normals right here with the attribute deletes. So we want to recompute the normals anyway. So if we middle click, now we have normals as well. So we have an opportunity to start reducing some of these polygon counts. And what I'm going to use to do so is this very, very handy node that once again is coming from side effects labs called poly reduce. Okay. Poly reduce node is pretty straightforward and simple, and it gives us an ability to uh, reduce the percentage of total polygons. Uh, you can choose to output a specific polygon count if you're trying to kind of match, I don't know, like maybe your supervisor said you can only have 25,000 polygons for this part. You can kind of put that in there. But I just like to keep it at percentage of input polygon count. I think it's just a lot easier uh, to deal with. The other thing that I like to do is I like to click on this preserve quads. So this is like a bit of a cool retopology trick where if there are some quads available on our mesh, Houdini is going to try to keep it even as we reduce the polygon count. And this, uh, this just kind of yields a little bit cleaner geometry in general. However, just be forewarned, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it can actually restrict the percentage of polygons that we're reducing. So, you know, just use at on a case by case scenario. So let's start by, I don't know, bringing this down to like 50%. Okay. And uh, what I tend to look is I like to have like a bit of a, like an overview just to make sure, especially some of the smaller parts, just to kind of make sure that there's nothing kind of funky going on and uh, there's not like some kind of weird, uh, you know, like, polygons intersecting in weird places and so on and so forth. 
All right, so now that we've reduced our mesh, we need some UVs, okay? And once again, Side Effects Labs to the rescue, I'm going to use this really cool node that Side Effects Labs gives us called Labs Auto UV. And personally, I find that this Auto UV node gives us, the majority of the time, it creates like some really, really usable UV layouts. And uh, if we hit Spacebar 5 to take a look at what it created, I like this. I mean, I think this works. Um, maybe we could try to be a little bit more efficient with, uh, you know, filling up the, the full tile. Right now it's not uh, rotating any of the islands, but we can say uh, maybe just kind of rotate them up to like 45 degrees and see if it makes a little bit more efficient use of the tile. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. There are also different algorithms that you can choose to, you know, split your different islands. I find that the uh, UV auto seam, uh, nine times out of ten, that's the best one. But you know, feel free to experiment with some of the other ones. And the other cool thing about this auto UV node is that it gives us the ability to assign a UDEM target tile. And in this particular case, for this model, I do want to use UDEMs. If you haven't seen my UDEMs tutorial, I encourage you to do so. UDEMs are awesome. They can be incredibly efficient and, um, and overall it's just kind of make managing this entire Cosmonaut mesh a lot easier because we don't have to go in and assign a bunch of like PBR materials for every single um, you know, type of material and we can just kind of say here, here's a bunch of UDEM tiles, sort it out automatically for us and it's just going to be so much easier when we're actually doing our animation and texturing and all this kind of stuff. So don't be afraid of UDIMs, UDIMs are cool. Let's go back to our perspective view here. And if you wanna take a look at what Auto UV actually did to your mesh, I would mention another really, really cool um, labs, side effects labs node called Labs UV Visualize. And what this node does is it takes all the UV information and translates it into a texture right here for us. So we can kind of take a look and get a general sense of what our density of the UV map is. And we can even enable this visualize UV islands. And now every UV island is assigned a different color and we can get a sense for what auto UV did. Last but not least, what I like to do is I like to add a null. I'm going to call this null out underscore uh, anodize blue anodize blue and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the UDEM tile number in here as well which in this particular case is 1001 and this is gonna help me to keep track of what's what so that when I'm looking at my entire node tree after I'm done with this I can kind of quickly say oh, okay you know this is what this is and this is the UDEM tile that it belongs to. Alright so moving right along I have another blast node and this time we have the anodized red group and we're gonna want to do some of the same things that we did to the previous group however this is the group that's got this kind of weird reversed normal little piece part so the first thing I want to do is just kind of fix it. So I'm just going to select it. I'm just going to select, draw like um, a square around it. And then I'm just going to hit tab and just say reverse. And what this is going to do is it's going to reverse the normals. And the reason why it's looking kind of weird and black right now is just simply because we're using this kind of smooth wire shaded. If we go to like a flat wire shaded, we'll see that this now is no longer blue and the polygons are oriented towards the right side of the mesh. 60,000 polygons, preserve quads, go to 50%. And once again, kind of look at the small little parts, just to kind of make sure that there's no weird things happening. Yeah, we're just, we're just losing some stuff that honestly doesn't really make much of a difference. So yeah, I'll, I'll take the 50% reduction. Once again, let's go to auto UVs and let it do its job. And I'm just gonna take a look here. Uh, this looks really clean as far as a UV unwrap job. It did it really, really fast. Uh, I don't even think I need to do any rotations or something like that. The one thing that I wanna do here, however, is change this UDEM target tile from 1001 to 1002. So it's gonna shift it by one position over to the next UDEM tile. And last but not least, add a null and call this an out 
anodized red, and then 1002 for our Udem tile. All right, don't worry, I'm not going to have you sit through every single one of those groups. We're going to fast forward in just a little bit. But I did want to go and at least talk about one of our thickest meshes here, which is this beta, beta cloth white. And if we middle click on this guy, this is over 1 million polygons. I mean, I think that we can optimize this quite a lot, probably even more than 50%. So let's, um, let's see how far we can go with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the poly reduce, okay? And uh, in here, I'm going to say preserve quads. And let's go down to 50% to start and whoops, we got a crash. All right, so we had our first crash of the day and I knew that it was coming. There is some bug or something like that going on in this poly reduce nodes for this particular group that if I have preserved quads enabled and then I start reducing the percentage, it crashes Houdini every single time. I don't know specifically what's causing this, um, but it's happening. If you're following along with this particular mesh, just uncheck preserve quads as far as this particular group, okay, this uh, beta cloth white. But with this unchecked, now we can start reducing this. So let's go down to 50%. At 50% reduction, this is looking pretty good, but I think we can go further than that. So let's go down to 25%. All right, so here we are at 25% and the mesh is still looking very detailed. I mean, I think this kind of goes to show you that there were so many polygons to begin with that even at a quarter of the polygons, we still have an incredible amount of detail happening here. Can we go even further? Uh, let's try 15%. All right, so here we are, 15%, still looking good. Can we go even lower? Let's try like 10%. All right, 10%, uh, we might maybe start getting a little bit of funky kind of things happening, especially here around the gloves. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it might be a little too aggressive where these folds are. So 15%, I think it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be reasonably okay for what I need. 1.7, almost like 2 million polygons, okay? And 5 million, uh, 5 and a half million vertices down to 260,000 polygons and 780,000 vertices. And we haven't really lost that much uh, definition on this mesh. I mean, we really haven't. So I am happy. I mean, for me, this is like a big success. Okay, one other scenario that I want to show you guys is the glass elements. Now, typically, I prefer not to poly reduce the glass elements unless they're really out of control. If I middle click here, it's 14,000 polygons. I can live with this. And the reason why is because what I found is using a poly reduce with things that are supposed to be transparent and very, very um, high specular, very shiny, uh, you tend to get like some real weirdness, especially in Substance Painter. So I prefer to leave the glass sections alone and just, you know, just let it be, especially if they're not completely out of control as far as polygon count is concerned. All right, so as promised, I'm not gonna have you guys sit and watch me do each and every one of these materials. So I just went ahead and did them all exactly the way I just showed you for the first few materials, which is that I use the blast node to isolate the material, then I use the poly reduce and kind of use my judgment to kind of see how much poly reduction I could do on a case by case basis. And last but not least, I used the auto UV node to generate a UV, um, you know, layout for us. And then I assigned that to the individual UDEM tile that I wanted to use for that material. So for instance, the first material is a tile 1001, second is 1002, 1003, 1004, and so on and so forth. And if we take a look at our UV view, then you'll see that we ended up with a grand total of 10, 20, and one, 21 individual UDEM tiles, okay? And some of you guys might be remembering at the beginning of the tutorial that we actually had 27 individual material groups. And you might be asking yourself, why are we only having 21 
udem tiles. If each udem tile matches a material, shouldn't we have 27? And you'd be absolutely 100% correct. And the reason why we only have 21 as opposed to 27 is that in some cases when um, one material uh, group uh, only contained like maybe a small little detail, like a little piece part, and that's it, I sought to combine that with another material group. And I thought that it'd probably be a little bit more efficient. So in some cases I did that and that's why we actually only have 21 UDEM tiles as opposed to 27 that match the individual material groups. Okay, uh, let me show you a couple different things. Uh, another thing that I did is um, right here, uh, there was this uh, beta cloth uh, white group, okay, and it had these uh, set of material or this set of objects, I'm sorry. And what I noticed is that this object was already pretty low poly, but these other ones were very high poly. And when I ran the poly reduce on everything, it tried to affect everything together, including this guy. And, uh, and I thought, you know, this guy is fine. I mean, this is what, like a dozen little polygons. I don't really need to reduce this any further. If anything, maybe I should kind of use a subdivide node on it. What I do want to do is only affect these guys. So what I did is I actually created a group uh, with just the high density elements. And then in my poly reduce, I was able to say only poly reduce on this specific group that I just created right here. So basically the poly reduce is leaving this guy in the middle alone because it doesn't really need to be poly reduced anymore. Uh, we're almost ready to export. I want to show you a couple little things. There is this little boogaboo here. So if you remember, we used the reverse normals because the normals were originally pointing in the wrong direction and we kind of used the reverse node to flip them. However, when we look at this under the smooth wire shaded, we see that it's black and this is obviously not correct. So we need to fix this somehow. And uh, I can't tell you exactly why this particular problem happens, but I can tell you how to fix it. So uh, Side Effects Labs is gonna come to a rescue once more with a node that's called Soften Normals. Labs, Soften Normals. And my understanding is that what this node does is it takes uh, the surrounding normals information and kind of averages them out to Kind of blend everything together so if we now look at what the output of the software normal is we'll see that now this problem has gone away and uh, in general i recommend using the soften normals node even if you don't have these kind of issues because i have found that when i bring it into substance painter the soften normals node does yield, I don't know, a little bit more even normals throughout my mesh and especially some of the smart materials are applied, I don't know, just look a little bit smoother to me, so why not? If it doesn't do any damage, why not? Okay, so before we export, I want to do a couple of other things. Uh, first of all, if we middle click on this, we'll see that we have some additional new attributes that we didn't have before, like curvature and island number. Those were generated by the auto UV uh, node. And we still also have all of these different groups that we probably don't really need. Now, keep in mind that the groups are different than the material attributes, the groups we were just using to be able to use in conjunction with the blast node so that we could isolate all the different uh, pieces parts of this mesh. So let's get rid of them. Let's start with the attributes. I'm going to say attribute delete. Uh, we definitely want to delete the curvature. We want to keep the position, um, but the curvature we don't really have any use for. On the vertex attribute, we want to leave this alone because this contains our normals, which are good, and it contains our texture maps, so don't touch those. We want to leave that alone. On the primitive attributes, we do want to get rid of this island number, but we want to make sure that we maintain our material, so don't delete the material or shop underscore material path attributes because this is going to come in handy for organizing all of our different UDEMs into different materials in Substance Painter, but as I said, the island number is not doing us any good, so get rid of it. And last but not least, on the detail attributes, we have a couple. We have coverage and num non-packed, and we can get rid of all of those by typing an asterisk. Okay, so this got rid of any 
unnecessary attributes that we didn't need. And now let's get rid of the groups. I'm going to do like a group delete node right here. And in the group delete, uh, we don't really need to select any specific group. We can get rid of all of them by just typing asterisk. Okay. So now we have a nice and clean, um, you know, set of attributes. We just have our point attributes. We have our normal, we have our UV maps, and then we have our materials. And that's really all that we need moving forward. Now we are ready to finally export our cosmonaut to go into Substance Painter. We've done all of our uh, optimization of the polygons. We unwrapped, uh, we have brand new spanking new UV maps. Uh, we divided them into UDEMs. Everything's great. We got rid of any unnecessary attributes and groups and stuff like that. Everything's good to go. So I'm gonna show you two different ways to export to Substance Painter. And the first method is for those of you who actually have a paid version of Houdini, such as Houdini Indie, in that case, uh, you can save into all sorts of different formats, and our preferred format is going to be FBX, okay? And in order to export as an FBX, I'm going to use the ROP FBX output node, okay? And this node is pretty straightforward, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to say save it to the desktop, let's call it cosmonaut underscore clean, clean, dot fbx okay and houdini you have to like type your suffix suffixes okay a couple of things that we need to do here uh what i like to do is i like to uncheck this export in ascii format and the reason that is is that if we go back to blender blender doesn't like ascii format fbx files so we need to uncheck this okay and uh, the other thing i like to do is i like to uh, click on this conserve memory at the expense of export time because it exports so quickly anyway, and if it saves me a little bit of hard drive space, why not? And then uh, there's this other uh, thing here, which is the conversion level of detail. Honestly, I don't know if this does a whole lot, or maybe it's only used in certain specific kind of uh, cases, but I like to kind of max it out, we'll go up to five, because more detail is always better, even if we don't really need it. But that's about it. Everything else can stay at the default value. Just gonna click save to disk, and this is gonna export the FBX that now we can import into Substance Painter. Okay, so now that I've done that for like the paid version of Houdini, for those of you that are following and that are using uh, the Apprentice version, which is the free version of Houdini, let me show you what you can do here in order to export all of your hard work. Whoa, 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 whoa. Actually, hold the presses. There is an even easier way of doing this, okay? So, uh, if you go into any one of those like kind of final nodes here, um, just uh, right click on it, okay? And you'll see that there is a save. Okay, so this is going to work in Houdini Apprentice. So just uh, select the save and say save geometry. Okay. And now you get this nice little pop up come up. And you can kind of say where you want to save it. And also there's this little drop down menu right here that allows you to select which uh, type of um, export file you want to use and normally it defaults to geo or bgeo but you can select obj just as easily just click on accept and it's going to do its thing and you have to do anything you don't have to like select any uh, of the settings and then all you have to do is just kind of go and verify that the file has been saved and you should be good to go for this Okay, so here we are in Substance Painter. Uh, we're going to texture our model in a completely different video tutorial, so don't worry about it. We're just kind of wrapping this one up. But I do want to make sure that whatever we exported from Houdini is going to work into Substance Painter because sometimes Substance can be a little bit finicky about importing the models. So let's start by importing our FBX file. So I'm just going to say new. Uh, I'm going to select my FBX right here. Click open. Uh, since we're going back to Blender, we want to make sure that the normal map format is set up as OpenGL and not DirectX. Uh, as a working resolution, 2K is going to be fine. And the only other thing I want to do is make sure that I use the UV tile workflow and I have this guy checked to preserve UV tile layout per material and enable painting across tiles. On that note, I'm just going to click OK and see what happens and kind of keep my fingers crossed. And we do have like some errors that are coming up, but 
Substance is kind of fixing them for us and kind of dealing with it. And the most important thing is that it is bringing our mesh into Substance the way it came out of Houdini. And this looks great to me. I mean, everything looks fantastic. I mean, the amount of detail is still there. I mean, it's just kind of amazing to me that we were able to reduce it by one fourth and we still have all of this detail on this mesh. And if I drag this guy over here, you can see that we have our texture set list. This is the material attributes that I was talking about in Houdini. So now we have everything already organized and you'll see that every material has its own UDEM tile. So this gives us a great deal of flexibility. It also allows us to select different resolutions when we finally export our texture maps so that maybe like if something doesn't really need to be super high resolution texture, we can kind of maybe make that a 1K output. But if something uh, that we're gonna see very close up, say like the visor or the helmet or something like that, if we need those textures to be very high resolution, we can go even as far up as 8K just for that. UDEM tile. So this is great and uh, let's check the OBJ file, right? Because we want to make sure that that works too for all you guys that are using Apprentice. So I'm just going to close this. Don't save. And let's do a new and this time I want to point it to one of our OBJ files that we generated. Let's go with the first one. And same settings, OpenGL, 2K resolution, uh, use UV tile workflow, everything else is good. And let's click OK and keep our fingers firmly crossed. And we do have a bunch of other errors that are being reported, but once again, Substance Painter is dealing with it. And once again, we're able to import our mesh and it looks great and um, it's fantastic. So I would say our job here is done. All right, as always, I think I've gone on way too long, but hopefully some of you guys will find some of this information useful. And, uh, you know, especially if you want to take advantage of some of these really, really amazing models that you can purchase on ArtStation or Gumroad or Sketchfab or TurboSquid and so on and so forth. I always like to point out that what I showed you today is a method that I've been able to utilize for myself that works for my needs. But there are, of course, many, many different ways of tackling some of these issues, maybe even more efficient ways. And uh, who knows, maybe there's some really cool add-ons or ways to do this even in Blender that are even faster. And if so, please let me know in the comments below because I'm always very interested in learning new things. On that note, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.